Once again, it is time to check in on Canoe EIT and see if this fund still floats your boat. Grab those life jackets, folks. This is going to be a good one. The main purpose of an income fund is to provide the investor with a regular stream of passive income via, of course, well, dividends. In Canada, one of the most popular of those income funds is, of course, Canoe EIT. Based out of Calgary, Alberta, this is a fund with a focus on delivering stable income by managing a diverse pool of income generating assets, which then allows them to pass on to the investor a very competitive dividend. When we dive into that asset pool, we will see that it is made up of a good cross-section of different sectors. The big four are energy at 19.7%, financials at 19.5%, industrials at 17.9%, and healthcare at 14.7%. They also, to a lesser degree, have assets within the materials, consumer staples, and consumer discretionary sectors. Finally, they do have a very small stake in the real estate sector, roughly about 1%. Regarding asset location, 55% of their assets are Canadian, 42.4% are American, 1.5% belong to the Swiss, and 1.1% come from the UK. Now, most of the account is equities, but there is a small fraction of fixed income as well as some cash and cash equivalents. With all that being said, the fact they named themselves Canoe in Canada has to be one of the more brilliant branding decisions ever. Join the conversation. Let us know in the comments if you hold any Canoe EIT in your portfolio. Your participation is well appreciated. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay up to date on future content and a huge thank you for that click. Canoe EIT was once the go-to when it comes to high dividend paying stocks. Even though nothing has really changed and they are still paying the same good dividend, they have gotten lost in all the noise created by the new covered call ETFs. However, before we make any judgments on whether Canoe should still have a place in our portfolios, we need to dive in deeper. It is time to hit up their fundamentals and that means we need to check in with our good old buddy Mr. Math. Let's begin with some surface data. They have net assets of $2.25 billion, and their beta is a little bit more volatile than the market average at 1.20. Their NAV, it comes in at 13.11, and they do have a management fee of 1%. Now, just to be clear, this is already worked into the payout structure. So the yield you see is what you are getting. The management fee is essentially deducted from the fund's total assets. It all happens behind the scenes. Their earnings per share come in at 1.32 and they have a price to earnings ratio of 8.80. Now we do not really have a peer group to compare an average to. This stock is closer to an ETF than to, well, a typical company stock. They have a price to book ratio of one and their return on equity comes in at 12.51%. This data does look fine to me. Let's dive in though a little bit deeper and take a look at their cash situation. Their revenue comes in at 307.19 million and they have earnings of 255.37 million. Their free cash flow that comes in at negative 50.12 million and that operating cash flow is the exact same at negative 50.12 million. Normally we like to look at fair value at this point but like an ETF, this is not a measurement that we can take for an income fund like Canoe. Thus, we will peel back even more and jump into the returns. They have a dividend yield of 9.217%. That is paid out monthly in the amount of 10 cents per share. And the payout ratio on that is 90.91%. This is a dividend that has not changed for a very long time. It has a history of sustainability. The fund managers do aim for a payout ratio in the low to mid 90% range. So it is exactly as desired designed. When we look at their returns on the three year, their price rose from $9.10 to $13.02. That is a return on investment of 43.08%. Adding in the dividends, and there is a lot of them, that brings that total return up to 82.64% on the one year. Their price, once again, it rose from $12.50 to $13.02. That's a return on investment of 4.16%. Factoring in the dividends, we do get a total return of 13.76%. Moving into 2023, their price actually fell from $13.48 to $13.02. That is a negative return on investment of negative 3.41%. However, those dividends do save us, bringing us back into the positive with a total return of 3.26%. The returns are not too bad considering this is not a total return stock and it is primarily designed for passive income. Let's go even deeper and take a quick gander at their debt. They have a total debt of 
17.48 million and they have total equities adding up to 2.17 billion. That's a debt to equity ratio of 14.64%. That's not too shabby. Over the last five years, this debt to equity ratio has actually decreased from 21.2% to 14.6%. So they are moving, of course, in the right direction. When it comes to cash and cash equivalents, they do have 98.23 million. So let's take a look at their short term. They have assets of 104.88 million and those liabilities, they come in at 117.83 million. Not the best, but they're pretty close. But let's look at that long term. On the long term, they have assets of 2.40 billion and liabilities of 219.39 million. That's pretty good. Even though overall I like this debt situation, I do have to point out with a negative operating cash flow, it is not able to cover their debt. The interest on the debt is fine though, as that is easily covered by their EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes. Nonetheless, this is still a good debt situation. Okay, so what is my final verdict? This is a stock or income fund that I have loved for quite a while. In fact, it is currently the highest stake in my portfolio. I only say this so you understand that I have some bias on this one. I always try to be impartial, but subconscious bias is a real thing. This is a fund that has been paying a 10 cents per share dividend for a very long time. They are consistent and they have a good strategy in the economic downturns that the market has been experiencing lately, such as the bear market and our attempts to recover from that bear market. If you are a passive income investor, this is truly a stock for you. Yes, there are higher paying covered call ETFs, but if you are looking to diversify your portfolio, then this is one that should be on your radar. If you are a growth investor, this is not the best choice. Even though we did see some nice growth on the three year, some of that was pandemic recovery growth. So recouping some of the value that was lost in the March 2020 drop. When you look at the 10 year chart, you can see that growth is not a huge factor. Normally the fund does range from just over $10 to about $12.50. So we have actually pushed a little bit higher than what the normal range is at this current time. We have even at one point made it all the way up to $14. So that's not too shabby. For a total return investor, this is a great situational stock if you play the ranges. So buy in when it is in the lower part of the range, then ride it up with dividends. It is also not a bad choice for the dividends as a 9% return is still better than the market. This is just a great little addition to your portfolio when you want to see some steady income every month. I would love to see them someday raise that dividend though, as you can argue that after all of the inflation, a dime is just not what it used to be. If you love this fund as much as I do, don't just blindly follow my enthusiasm without doing your own research. It is your hard-earned cash you are about to drop on the table, and that deserves that extra heaping helping of due diligence. Keep the learning going. Watch my video on the utility sector linked on the left or test YouTube's recommendation skills by checking out the video on the right. Your choice will decide the winner and I will see you in the next video.